Timberline Lodge, nestled in the heart of the Mount Hood National Forest, has long been a favorite place of recreationists in the Pacific Northwest. Over the years, millions of Americans and visitors from all over the world have come to Timberline to ski, climb Mount Hood Summit, hike scenic trails, or simply relax in the lodge's rustic splendor. Although built during the mid-1930s, the idea for a lodge located on the southern slope of Mount Hood had been around for nearly a decade. It wasn't until approached by the Works Progress Administration in 1935, however, that the Forest Service granted approval for the project. We go around all dressed in rags while the rest of the world goes neat. And we have to be satisfied with half enough to eat. We have to live in lean-tos or else we live in a tent. For when we buy our bread and beans, there's nothing left for rent. We'd rather not be on the rules of relief or work in the WPA. We'd rather work the Works the Progress farm. Administration, or WPA, was created by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in an effort to combat the Depression that saw over 25% of the nation's workforce unemployed. Timberline Lodge was only one of many projects undertaken by this New Deal agency. But it was clear from the start that the lodge was destined to be one of its greatest achievements. So special was the project that on September 28, 1937, President Roosevelt visited the lodge in order to dedicate it in person. The Timberline Project was a cooperative effort between government agencies and the private sector. The Forest Service, an agency of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, was assigned the responsibility of designing and engineering the lodge and worked with the private firm of architect Gilbert Stanley Underwood. The WPA was responsible for recruiting craftsmen and laborers from the roles of the unemployed. The Federal Art Project, an agency of the WPA, was responsible for supplying wood carvers and artists. Lorenz Brothers Construction Company acted as the general contractor and supplied many of the project's foremen and supervisors. A team of four Forest Service architects, led by Tim Turner, spent several months designing the rustic mountain lodge. Architect Lynn Forrest was assigned the task of designing the exterior, while Howard Gifford designed the interior and Dean Wright the majority of the wrought iron work. The influence of consulting architect Gilbert Stanley Underwood can be seen in the final design of the exterior. The main concern of all the architects was for the lodge to exist in harmony with its mountain setting. While the Forest Service provided the design team, the mountain's history and environment provided inspiration for the design. Three major themes, the wildlife of the Northwest, the Indian culture, and the pioneer spirit guided the arts and craft projects. Northwest wildlife, both plant and animal, is depicted in paintings, mosaics, and wood carvings. The Indian culture is brought out in the wood carvings and textiles and the spirit of the pioneers is seen in the rustic construction of the lodge, the wood relief carvings, and other woodworking projects. Four workshops were set up in Portland by the WPA to produce furnishings, wrought iron, textiles, and art pieces for the project. The woodworking shop, supervised by Ray Newford, had already produced a number of pieces for the WPA when the Timberline project began. The shop employed 15 to 20 skilled carpenters and created most of the wood projects for the lodge. The task began with the newel posts. Artist Florence Thomas was hired to fashion plaster of Paris models of 12 northwest animals and birds that were to be carved onto the newel posts. The models were then given to the wood shop for carving. The shop's next project was to build furniture for the lodge. Because of the rushed nature of the Timberline project, there was no time to draw up plans. The furniture simply evolved from the woodworker's creativity, 
which produced a unique style of furniture that would meet the needs of generations of future users. An example of this creativity is the one-of-a-kind ram's head table, which has earned itself a place in the Cascade dining room. The woodworking shop also created two major lighting fixtures for the lodge. The long wooden lamps in the former ski deli are symbolic of Indian war canoes, while the oxbow lamps in the lower lobby relate to the area's pioneer history. Construction workers on the building site also contributed to the woodcrafts by adding carvings to the interior and exterior of the lodge. Carved Indian symbols found around the ski lobby represent the moons or months of the Indian calendar. These symbols, intended to convey a feeling and not an authentic representation, were obtained from a campfire girl's handbook. Exterior accents include Indian-like symbols carved over the main entrance, over the doors leading from the north patio into the main lobby, and beneath the windows of the Cascade dining room. The stylized Indian head on the door leading to the ski lobby was designed by Lynn Forrest, one of the Forest Service architects. Forrest designed into the carving the monograms of six Forest Service employees who helped with the Timberline project. Outside are several carved animal heads, placed so they appear to be part of the large structural beams. The carved heads now in place are reproductions made for the Forest Service in 1961 to replace the originals, which had become badly weathered. Several federal art project workers also contributed to the woodworking projects in the lodge. With the help of Walker and Ambrose Allegar, artist Amy Gorham developed the two wood marquetry pieces found in the northeast and northwest foyers of the main lobby. The works, called coyotes and mountain lions, were made by selecting different species of wood, cutting them with an inlay knife, and piecing them together. There are also two relief carvings by federal art project artists. Forest scene by Eric LeMay, and Cougar Resting in Forest by Florence Thomas. Originally, the Thomas piece was hung over the fireplace in the Cascade dining room. However, Marjorie Hoffman Smith, the lodge's interior decorator, did not approve of it and had it replaced by LeMade's forest scene. The Thomas piece was moved to a less prominent place in the main lobby. Melvin Keegan, created the three redwood panels found on the first landing of the south stairway. These panels depict the struggles of Oregon's pioneers crossing the Cascade Mountains on the Barlow Road. Just as the woodworking project began, the WPA-sponsored blacksmith shop turned its attention to the Timberline project. O.B. Dawson had been hired earlier to recruit and train blacksmiths to make ornamental ironwork for other WPA projects. In a shop in downtown Portland, every piece of ironwork, from hinges and door latches to the sculptured iron door knocker, was wrought. This is a process by which iron is heated in a forge until it's malleable, then hammered into shape. Reflected heavily in the ironwork are the three themes which guide the artwork of the lodge. The dining room gates are probably the best example of this, with all three themes represented. The wildlife theme is seen in the coyote heads across the middle, while the zigzag and half-moon designs are reminiscent of Indian symbols. The hand-forged nature of the gates adds the pioneer touch. The light fixtures were fashioned in many sizes and designs, some said to represent insects, such as a ladybug or a water skipper. The large chandeliers in the main lobby contain the only cast iron in the lodge. These fixtures were built in a matter of a few days 
when the shop received the designs in mid-September, along with the request to have them completed in time for President Roosevelt's September 28th visit. The oversized fireplaces in the main lobby and ski lobby require massive andirons to match their scale. The blacksmith shop met the challenge by recycling several pieces of used railroad rail. It took a pair of blacksmiths two weeks to chisel away the footings and hammer the rails into matching spirals. There were many other pieces constructed by the blacksmith shop, including window grills, strapping to hold beams, and door accent pieces. But the finest piece of ironwork in the lodge came from the blacksmith Ed Frisk, who, at 68, created the front door knocker from a design by Dean Wright. While the ironwork of O.B. Dawson's blacksmiths lends a hard, sturdy feeling to Timberline, the textiles projects conceived and supervised by Marjorie Hoffman Smith adds a soft, warm touch to the lodge. Smith recruited unemployed women from the Portland area to hand-weave material for the draperies and upholstery. Curtains and bedspreads for the guest rooms were made of sailcloth with designs hand appliqued using scrap materials. The rug hooking project recycled wool uniforms and blankets cast off by the Civilian Conservation Corps, another of Roosevelt's Depression-era work relief agencies. The used wool was first cut into strips about one quarter inch wide and then dyed to the desired color. Burlap was stretched across a wooden frame and the wool strips were pulled through the heavy woven fabric to form the rug's pile. All in all, 119 rugs were hand-hooked for the project. The lodge houses a fine collection of oil paintings and watercolors, executed for Timberline by artists working for the Federal Art Project. The most notable contributor was C.S. Price. Price painted a total of five oils for the project, including two large murals that were originally intended for the Cascade Dining Room. The murals, entitled Huckleberry Pickers and Pack Train, were rejected by the Forest Service and disappeared from the lodge. They were later discovered and turned over to the Portland Art Museum. In 1975, they were returned to the lodge and hung in the C.S. Price wing. Two of his smaller oils are hanging in the mezzanine along with the works of Darrell Austin. Austin, also a nationally known artist, painted musicians and the humorous and colorful dishwashers. Charles Haney, who is referred to the Federal Art Project by C.S. Price, painted The Mountain. It's hanging in the main lobby near the entrance to the Cascade Dining Room. Howard Sewell, a student of C.S. Price, painted two large murals, wood and metal, to honor the craftsmen who worked on the Timberline Project. These murals were originally intended for the ski lobby but were hung in the Cascade Dining Room as replacements for the Price murals. They now hang in the mezzanine. Both paintings are done in a stylized Egyptian form that was popular in the 1930s. Watercolor studies of local wildflowers were painted by eight different artists, among them a man named Karl Führer. Born in Germany, Führer spent years traveling around Europe copying the great masterpieces. He later came to this country, and at the time of the Timberline Project, was living on the streets of Portland in the piano crate, eating beans soaked in cold water. The murals in the former ski deli are unusual because of material artist Douglas Lynch chose to use. The murals are made of linoleum panels, carefully incised with a mat knife, then painted and covered with several layers of shellac. Collectively, the panels are known as the Calendar of Sports, for they show the great variety of activities that occur on Mount Hood throughout the year. Only nine of the original 11 panels exist today. The glass mosaic that greets visitors at the entrance to the ski lobby was designed by Tom Lehman and executed by Pete Ferrerin. 
entitled Spring in the Mountain, it illustrates some of the plants and animals found on Mount Hood in the spring and summer months. The mosaic was assembled in a Portland art shop on a piece of plywood in mirror image, then brought to the lodge and installed. The Blue Ox Bar, located on the ground floor of the lodge, was originally designed as a storage area for firewood. Marjorie Hoffman Smith had the room converted to a bar when she realized that the lodge contained no drinking establishments. A 27-year-old Portland artist named Virginia Darcy was commissioned to execute three murals depicting the legendary logging team of Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. Darcy chose to execute the murals in glass using a technique called opus sectile. The term means work in pieces and refers to the use of large pieces of colored glass cut to the size and shape required by the composition. Upon completion of the Timberline project, the administration of the lodge was turned over to the Forest Service. For the next 16 years, a succession of private companies and individuals tried to operate the lodge. The succession ended in February 1955 when the lodge was forced to close seemingly forever. Mismanagement, abuse, and vandalism had taken their toll. Lodge operators had allowed the building to fall into a state of disrepair. Rain and snow seeped through the roof and broken windows. Floors were ruined by plumbing leaks. Heavy ski boots scarred the oak floors. Furniture and artwork disappeared from the lodge. Upholstery became frayed and thoughtless visitors working in dim corridors carved their names into the woodwork. The beginning of the Timberline Renaissance came in July of 1955 when the Forest Service issued Richard Costum, president of RLK and Company, a 20-year special use permit to operate the lodge. Almost immediately, RLK and Company and the Forest Service began cleaning and refitting the lodge. Under authority of the Granger Thigh Act, the Forest Service was able to take the money RLK and Company paid to the government in rent and use it to help maintain the lodge. The job was far from over, however, as all of the Forest Service funds were targeted for repair and maintenance of the lodge's physical plant. Little or no money was available to repair or replace the arts and crafts of the lodge. The addition of the Timberline Lodge to the National Register of Historic Places in 1974 provided the Forest Service and RLK and Company with the impetus to restore the lodge's arts and crafts, but provided no funding or manpower to do the job. This problem was remedied in 1975 with the creation of a volunteer group called the Friends of Timberline. As their first project, the friends undertook to restore the draperies, upholstery, and rugs in the lodge's main lobby. Since then, almost every corner of the lodge has been affected in some way by this dedicated group. The biggest change in Timberline came about as the result of the construction of Y.E. Stay Lodge. Built by the Forest Service at a cost of $7,200,000, the Day Lodge was designed to house all of the ski-related facilities and day-use activities formerly crowded into Timberline Lodge. The effect of the Day Lodge has been to eliminate overcrowding and reduce the wear and tear on the historic lodge. The construction of the Day Lodge emphasizes the Forest Service commitment to preserving Timberline Lodge while allowing a commercial venture to flourish. Today, the Forest Service, RLK and Company, and the Friends of Timberline are partners in the continuing effort to restore and maintain Timberline Lodge as, in the words of President Roosevelt, a place for generations of Americans to come in the days to come.
Thank you.